Do an intro or no? Your mic, no, your mic's live. Don't be nervous. <laughs> Sounds good. So we'll get rolling here. If anybody trickles in, we'll just kind of let them grab a seat here. So first off, I want to say welcome to the office. Um, you know, we're, we're very excited to have you up here. We do these classes on a regular basis. And our mission since opening the office in Midland and the office in Saginaw is just to make the community healthier in any avenue possible. And so obviously we're a chiropractic office, so that's our main focus. But when we're doing after hours events and we're out in the community, people about nutrition, about exercise, about immune system, about supplements, anything that is in the, the natural health world, because ultimately when you're trying to get healthy and people start trying to make a change, what happens is they end up with a million questions, right? And so they get online, they go onto what I call Dr. Google and they, they type in a question about their health and then it up pops a million different results. And so they start clicking through them and they just get more and more confused. And so we like to make classes on questions that we get most frequently. And so the class tonight is called Exercise Less, Eat More, Lose Weight. Is there anyone in here that would like to exercise less, spend less time exercising, eat more food, and actually see results and lose weight? Everybody can potentially raise their hand, right? Because we're very busy, we have a lot of things going on. Through, uh, throughout our lives on a regular basis. And so we're gonna go through some, some tips tonight uh, in the exercise world and also in the nutritional world. How many people have been to the basic nutrition class before? Have you been to the basic? Yeah. Sure, I don't know if you have or not. I know you've been to the last few ones, but you'll be at the next one, okay. along with the rest of you, right? Yeah, so, so tonight kind of builds on the basic nutrition class. So that's a very good one to sit through as well. So the problem is when people go out and they want to get into shape, you know, when, when do people want to get in shape? New Year's, you know, anniversaries, reunions, summer, vacations. There's all sorts of different times throughout the year when people want to get into better shape. And, and they do that by exercising and eating healthy in most cases. But there's a lot of things that go wrong. And one of the first things is that and you try to find a diet, 3,000 different circulating diets at any time. So there's always new diets, always new trendy diets and this and that. And um, as you can see, kind of scroll through here, there's a few of these. And I wish some of these worked better than others, like the, the cookie diet down here in the bottom. That would be a great one, right? Um, the Taco Bell diet, some of those. No, I don't wish that one worked. And I've never been a fan of Taco Bell, thankfully. So, But my point is you can get online and everybody in this room can take on a different diet. And some of you might see results, some of you might not see results. And so the thing is, we want to take the, the factors out of each of those diets and see what works together. So a lot of the diets, if you actually go down and you start reading books, I love reading books and reading research and that sort of stuff. And a lot of people argue what diet's the best, what about this one, what about this one? But if you really look at these different types of diets, they have a lot of overlap in them, okay? And the nutritional protocols have a lot of overlap in them where the people can agree. And there are certain points where they start to disagree on different topics and and how much meat and how much and that. But the point is, we have 3,000 different diets. We're always doing uh, you know, the diet trends and this and that, and we still have two thirds of our population overweight. And so along with that, weight problem comes al along with a lot of these different issues. So a 15 pound weight gain from your natural weight increases your risk of type two diabetes by 50%. A uh, 22 pound weight gain increases your risk of heart failure by upwards of 75%. So that's from the Okinawa Diet Plan, a book out there. Um, where it has a lot of research from these people that are living off the land, they're living the, the native culture, and they have no issues, they have no heart disease, they have no diabetes, they have no cancer. And you take these people out of their natural environment, put them into a very industrialized world, and what happens to them? They get heart disease, they get diabetes, they get cancer, they get rheumatoid arthritis, they get fibromyalgia, they get all these different things because of their environment. And so what we, we now know is that upwards of 90 to 95% of your health depends on your lifestyle, okay? 90 to 90% of your health depends on your lifestyle. And so the research is 70 to 95%, I should say. But that means that you have a lot of control over your lifestyle. And so what the researchers now know is that our genes are more like light switches, right? Our genes are more like light switches. And so there's this whole field that's called epigenetics, how the, the lifestyle and how your environment influences your, your overall health. And so when you're born, everybody in here has genes for certain diseases and certain conditions. So everybody in here has genes for cancer and heart disease and diabetes and Alzheimer's. Everybody has genes for those. The question is whether you activate those genes or not, right? 
And so our, our genes are like light switches. When you're born, those light switches are all turned off. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, the things that we've been talking about here. And so those genes are, are turned off. As you live your life and you start to acquire stress, you're more likely to activate those genes. And so for one person, that gene could be, you know, some sort of arthritis. For another person, that gene could be something for heart disease or a certain type of cancer. And so they could be under the exact same amount of stress, but they present different conditions. Does that kind of make sense to you? And so as you acquire more and more stress, you start to flip on those light switches. Now think about an average day for an American. It's pretty stressful, right? From the time that you wake up, you got to get up. You got to get ready to get out of the door for work. You have deadlines at work. You're probably, you know, sitting most of the day, which is not a very good thing anyways. Um, if you're not preparing your, your meals and you might not be eating healthy, you have, you know, deadlines for, you know, projects, you have to pick up your kids, you have financial things to worry about. Stress just builds up. Okay. And so we now know that we have a lot of control over our, our health by controlling our lifestyle in the nutrition and the exercise are two very, very important things. And so before we get into even talking about exercise or nutrition, you have to talk about preparing to get into that. Okay. And so one of the number one reasons why people don't actually finish an exercise routine. So if, if anyone in here runner, anyone here likes run five Ks, no runners. <laughs> so this class is good for you because we're going to be talking about different options, but 70 to 80% of runners on a regular basis experience what injury, which stops them from running. So how productive of a runner are you? If you're spending half your season injured, you're not nearly as good as you, you potentially could be. So the first thing is, if you want to start an exercise routine, you need to address any injuries that you have. They're going to stop you from finishing that exercise routine. So most people just, you know, January 1st comes rolling around. They're like, all right, I'm going to go to the gym four to five days a week, but they have this chronic issue with their shoulder and they go to the gym and what happens? They hurt their shoulder again. So they go, oh, my shoulder hurts. I'm going to go home and sit on the couch. Right. And that's the real world. We see that all the time. And so that's where I give chiropractic a shout out because we look at the whole body. We want to see what's going on from a physical standpoint, try to get people moving. It's not just chiropractic. It's physical therapy. It's uh, doing, you know, foam rolling exercises, it's creating a stretching routine, doing something to address the issues that you have, you know, being proactive. And also, what does that do? Stretching. You know, if you're stretching, you're doing exercise, you're doing yoga, something like that, it gets your ribs moving better. And it's going to help to increase the amount of oxygen that you're breathing on a regular basis. If you're exercising, oxygen is pretty dang important, right? If you get more oxygen into your system that can actually feed your muscles, you're going to be able to do more exercise which is going to boost your metabolism and ultimately, ultimately lead you to see better results. And so that's very good as well. Um, obviously, we talked about the pain, reducing pain and getting a better workout is very important. Improving digestion. So moving properly is vitally important for digestion. A lot of people don't think about that, but you take your dog out walk, what happens? It makes it go to the bathroom, right? And most people sit on a regular basis. They sit in a chair all day. Their, their bowel movements are not proper and their digestion is not working properly. So this creates a lot of issues. If you're eating good food, you want to absorb that food, right? You want to get the maximum amount of nutrients out of that food on a regular basis. And so you want to have proper digestion as well. You know, I have improved thyroid function. Thyroid is a very metabolic organ, you know, and getting active, getting exercise normalized, eating healthy foods helps improve thyroid, which helps to improve metabolism from that standpoint. So this list could go on and on and on, but the point is you need to actually think about what your, your health is before you start exercising so you address any conditions that are going to potentially prevent you from exercising. So that's the first thing here. Now let's talk about exercise. Now exercise is one of the first things that people do, but one of, it's one of the biggest things that people do wrong, okay? And so when, when the New Year's comes around, you, you think of a, the gym, you know, you have the gym here, people wait 360 days out of the year, right? 350 days out of the year. And then January 1st comes around. And what's that new year's resolution look like? <sighs> Exercise, lose weight, get in better shape. You know, all these, these big goals that they set for the, for the year. And this is what the gym looks like right through here. Right. And so the problem with exercise, when you walk into a gym, the easiest thing in most cases for people to do is to walk, to get on a stair climber, or do something like that, which can be a very great exercise. Don't get me wrong, but we're going to explain this here. And so 
when you walk into a gym and you get on a treadmill, so you go into the gym, you get on the treadmill, you put it up to three mile an hour and you start walking, your body kind of responds and goes, okay, so what's going on here? They're doing something, they're doing something different than sitting right now. So your body's responding instantly to that scenario. And so you start moving, your muscles are getting activated, but then pretty soon your body goes, oh, I've done this before. I can walk. You know, I remember walking last week, we walked for an hour around. And so pretty soon your body adapts to that and it down regulates to conserve as much energy as possible because your body always, always, always wants to save energy. It does not want to expend energy. And I'm going to tell you how to expend the proper energy. And so within a minute or two, your body starts to adapt. And you know this by uh, watching your breath. And so if you're doing an exercise on a treadmill and you get out of breath to start and then your breath kind of comes back where you can easily have a conversation with someone else, then your body has adapted. If you're doing anything on an exercise routine or on a workout routine where you can sit there and have a conversation with someone else, then your body has already adapted and you're not going to see the most benefit. It's great for, you know, just moving your body and mental stress is one of the best things, you know, just to go out and take a nice walk. Like it's beautiful outside. You go out for a walk. It's great for mental stress and it's great for moving your body but it's not the best thing for weight loss. The class tonight is called, it's about losing weight and about getting in better shape. And so a lot of people will come into the office and say, you know, I'm gonna take up jogging and I'm gonna jog a you know, 5K or a half marathon or a marathon and I'm gonna do that to lose weight. And I've seen a ton of people that go on and they finish their 5K and they do great and they finish their half marathon or their marathon, but they don't actually lose weight, okay? In most cases, a lot of those people might not actually lose weight. They'll, they'll finish the race, but they're not getting to where they want to be. And so I call this, if you're getting on that treadmill and you're just walking over and over for what's the recommendation for, from the you know, American College of Sports Medicine for exercise on a regular basis? What's that? It's about 30 to 45 minutes a day, five to six days a week, right? Exercise, and that's their protocol to get people in shape and to lose weight and to, to fight the obesity epidemic that we talked about in, in the beginning here. So that's the type of exercise that they're recommending. Walking, you know, maybe a, a jog or something like that. But if you're not getting out of breath, your metabolism's not going to get spiked. So I call this a human hamster wheel. I wrote an article on it. It's human hamster wheel. So if you take like a hamster or a gerbil, they're chubby little creatures, right? You put them in their, their cage, and they get on that little hamster wheel, and what do they do? They run, 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 run. They run, 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 but they don't ever lose weight, right? And so they're still chubby. And so obviously we're not the same as hamsters or gerbils. We have different hormones. But my point is if you get on the treadmill and you're going at the same pace uh, every day, same speed, same pace all the time, you're probably not going to start losing weight, and you're probably not going to be reaching your goals for getting in their shape unless – you're a 5K runner, and your whole purpose is to run a 5K or to run a half marathon or to run a marathon or do some sort of running distance or a long distance bike ride. If that's your goal, that's great. But if your goal is to lose weight, there's better ways to do it. And so you want to start switching up what you're doing. Now, the better way is to do exercises that keep you off guard, keep your, your brain confused and to not be able to control your metabolism and to conserve energy. Okay, and so this is called interval training or burst training. Has anyone ever heard of interval or burst training? Most people have, right? And so interval training or burst training is very, very efficient. And so what it does is it catches your brain off guard because your brain always wants to kind of know what's going on. So you do a quick burst of energy. You know, it could be, it could be riding a bike really fast. It could be running. It could be doing a lot of different exercises. We'll go through a few of these. But if, you, if you're doing that stuff, it's going to catch your body off guard. And so let's go through two different examples here. <clears throat> so on the right, we have a, a marathon runner. And so many people, have, you ever watch marathons? So the marathons, what's a training routine look like for a marathon runner, an elite marathon runner? Long distance running. So it could be... Building up to it, coming back, building up some more, coming back, like a stair step. Sure. But like, running, no weights, no so it could be 12 miles to 14 to 18 to 20 to 22. A lot of these people are, they're very high mileage, right? Mm -hmm. And they're spending a couple hours a day running on a regular basis. So what do you notice between the physique, the difference of the marathon runner on the right and the, marath uh, the sprinter on the left? Drawn 
Yeah. And so a lot of these marathon runners, I've, I've been uh, lucky enough to actually go to some of these marathons and I watched the world record be broken in Berlin um, about a year and a half ago. And so these marathon runners, they're, they're very lean, small people. So a lot of them are five foot four, 130 pounds, you know, five foot eight, 145 pounds. And so they're very small and very thin because is it very efficient to carry that energy a long distance. This is the most elite people out there, you gotta remember, okay? So they're spending a couple hours a day doing long distance running at a pretty good pace, you know, at a very fast pace, I should say. And then you have the sprinter over here. What does the sprinter's exercise routine look like? So they're, in a lot of cases, yeah, their, their workout routine is gonna be, so if he's a 100 meter sprinter, He's probably going to do a lot of stretching, you know, and that sort of stuff to get real limber. But then the main workout for that day could be going and doing eight 100 meter sprints, maybe 120, maybe 80 meters, depending on what they're working on, maybe their acceleration. But how long does it take these guys to do 100 meters? Less than 10 seconds, right? And so if he's doing 10 sprints at 10 seconds, he's only doing 100 seconds of exercise, right? And so he's doing less than two minutes of exercise. And how long does it take them to run a marathon? A couple hours, right? The world record is right around two hours. And so two hours of exercise, two minutes of exercise, right? From a high intensity standpoint. And so you can see their physique. And when I was in college and I worked with some of these sprinters and I was a sprinter as well, a lot of these sprinters, they don't even spend that much time in the weight room. And so what they're doing is the interval training that they're doing the very, very high intensity exercise at 100% effort for them is actually helping to build muscle because they're stressing their muscles to the max. And that's when they're actually building muscle and adding on the, the muscle mass to their body. And so you can see a big difference here. And what do we know about muscle from a metabolic standpoint? It eats fat, it eats sugar, it eats energy, right? It's always, always burning, right? And so you wanna have some muscle mass. And a lot of women will say, well, I don't wanna look like this guy. Trust me, your hormones are completely different, so you're not going to look like this guy. It's going to increase your metabolism, but it's going to burn fat and get you toned if you're running like a sprinter. And so we're not telling everybody here to strap on their spikes and go to the track and start doing sprints. That's not what we're talking about. But my point is, if you're doing short bursts of exercise, instead of going to the gym for an hour and a half a day, if you're doing this type of stuff in 30 minutes or less, you're going to be zapped. If you're putting a maximum effort into something for even 10 to 15 minutes, you're going to be zapped. Okay, and so we're gonna go through a workout routine. But another cool thing is that when you, when you deplete your system of oxygen, so when you deplete your system of oxygen, what happens is your body requires more oxygen, right? Because you're depleting it, so you need to get more in. How do you do that? So you start breathing heavy. When you start breathing heavy, that's when you know that you're activate, activating your metabolism to get to this point of seeing the benefit. And when you actually get to that point where you actually create an oxygen deficit, where you're sucking in a lot of oxygen, where you're you know, bending over, trying to catch your breath, what that does, that actually stimulates your metabolism and it'll actually stimulate growth hormone, okay? Now, growth hormone is very, very good. You hear in the news all the time, these athletes are, are illegally taking growth hormone, right? Because they want to get big and they want to hit the ball harder, or they want to lift more weight or whatever they're doing. But your body can produce that naturally at a natural level. And it's actually very, very healthy. It shows a, there's a ton of other benefits from a research standpoint to have increased levels of growth hormone. But people who are doing the high intensity interval training, they're stimulating this inside their body. And so what happens is after you do that high intensity interval training, and if you go and you do, let's say you were at the track, you do your sprints, you know, and then you go home and you're actually just laying on the couch, your growth hormone stays elevated for 19 to 24 hours after the exercise. So you're doing your exercise, you're still sitting at home the next day still seeing benefits from doing that exercise. Whereas when you're doing something like this and your body adapts to it and it's more aerobic, that growth hormone is not stimulated. And so as soon as you leave that exercise, or you stop doing that exercise. That's Whereas I would rather go home and relax and still see benefit for the next 19 to 25 days. So this sort of exercise, which is modified per person, is, is going to be the best route for you. And so here's the example of, so the first thing is you need to find that is a good exercise for you. So everybody in here is different. And so we've had people that are like, There's an, I can't do any of that stuff up there. 
But I'm like, well, can you walk? And so they'll say, walk it for a fast pace all the way down this hallway to the back of the office, and you were to walk back up here at a fast pace, are you going to be out of breath? And if they're 100 pounds overweight, most likely it's going to get them out of breath. And so for them, walking fast for 20 seconds is going to get them to the point where they're breathing heavier, right? And so that's a, a very good exercise for them. Now, someone who's a little bit better and is in better shape, this is where you can kind of get creative and you can do different things. And so if you do like running, then you can go out and you for 20 seconds and then you just relax for 20 seconds. And you run at a fast pace for 20 seconds and then you relax for 20 seconds. And so a lot of different ways to do this. There should be another 20 second um, intensity. So there should be three rounds in this. So you're doing three eccentric paces for 20 seconds. You get a two minute rest period. And then at the end of that two minute rest period, you start going through the cycle again. And so some different types of exercises, jump roping, you know, jumping jacks, mountain climbers. If you're in the gym over here, you can use the stair climbers. I love running stairs. I mean, that's a good exercise if you're, if you're going at a pretty fast pace. Stair climber, um, the elliptical, the skiing machine, the rowing machine. I love using the rowing machine as well. Anything that you can do on a regular basis that'll start to get you fatigued after any set period of time. Okay, and if you can't find something that gets you out of, out of breath in 20 seconds, then do it for 30 seconds or do it for 40 seconds. So this number is variable as well. And then you can repeat that entire set three times. Another fun thing to do is you can actually do 20 seconds of one exercise, take a break, go to do 20 seconds of another exercise, take a break, and then do 20 seconds of another exercise, right? And so there's a lot of fun body weight exercise you can do. Um, body weight squats are a very good exercise because when you're using your legs, they're a very big muscle and they suck up a lot of energy. Another thing are down-ups. I really like functional exercises. I saw the face, you hate those, huh? And they're very tough, right? And so if you do down-ups, you guys know what down-ups are? And so down-ups are, yeah, when you get on the ground, so if you're on the ground here and you're in this position, then you're gonna get up into a standing position and you would essentially jump up, okay? So I'm doing it real slow, but if you're good, you pretty much jump on the ground and you jump up. But it's a very functional exercise because what happens is people, if they're, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old, and they're not able to get up off the ground, what happens if they're walking across the parking lot in the winter and they slip in the ground? They're gonna lay there until someone comes and gets them, right? And so squats, you know, it's a very important exercise. If you're losing the strength in your legs, when is the number one, what's the number one cause of death among the elderly? Something, uh, a condition related to falls, right? So people fall and they break their hip, they have surgery, they have an infection, they have an issue with it. And that's the number one cause of death. We see that all the time with, you know, either our, you know, patients or family or friends and that sort of stuff. But a lot of times they fall because their legs are weak. Okay. And so having strong legs and being able to get up and off the ground is one very important thing. Um, but just doing body weight squats. So if you just find a chair and you sit on it and you were just to do this really quickly for 20 seconds, that's going to get you out of breath probably. And so... There's a lot of different options. Another thing that I really like is would be like a squat thruster. And so if you had, let's say you had two five or 10 pound weights in your hands, you would sit down here, you would stand up and you would push up and you'd sit down and you'd stand up and you push up. Okay. So now you're using your legs, you're using your back, you're using your arms, you're using your shoulders. And so you're activating a lot of muscles at that standpoint. But the fun thing is you can do whatever exercise. If it's, if it's cold outside, then you can do down-ups inside, you can do squats, you can do all sorts of stuff if, if you have a, a bike or whatever inside. If it's nice outside, get outside and do something outside. You know, if you have kids or whatever, this is a great thing to do with them as well. So you just set up three little stations. You know, you go from one station to the next station to the next station. But the thing is, you need to get out of breath. And so if you're not getting out of breath, you're not getting those benefits. And so that you always have to modify that as best as possible. And that's going to be one of the the easiest things to do on a regular basis. And so if you're doing this um, whole thing, you know, 10 minutes, plus you do some stretches, let's say you do five, 10 minutes of stretching to start, and you do five minutes of cool down, you're only less than half an hour still. You know, by the time you're, you're going to the gym and that sort of stuff, it takes longer. So if you don't have time to always get to the gym, it just takes longer. But when you have access to a gym and you go on there and you know what you're gonna do when you get in there, 
this is a very, very effective way to get in shape because you have access to all the equipment. When you're at home, you only have access to mostly body weight stuff. So this is a, a very, very good thing to do on a regular basis. So does anyone have any questions on this before we move forward? Yeah. Mm -hmm. To the point I can't breathe anymore. Sure. So, um, is there any tricks to, or is that just like, make sure to use my inhaler? No, I mean, that. I'm on an inhaler, like, I tried to um, do like one of those stations, high sure. intensity stations before, and I passed out in the bathroom. Yeah. And, and because I got, like, I was just laying on the floor. And so the, the heart rate skyrockets so fast. I don't yep. Know. So, it's hard for me to do high intensity because I don't know an alternative to try to slow myself down so I don't get that. Absolutely. And so the first, like the side that I said, prepare your body. The thing you'd want to do is if you've only tried to an inhaler, I mean, have you, have you talked to someone about nutrition for asthma or any other supplements for asthma? It would be do some research. The first thing would be do some research to see what else you can do to help with asthma. You know, from a chiropractic standpoint, if your ribs are moving better, you can get air into your lungs better and it can help out from that standpoint. Uh, certain foods are inflammatory that can definitely exacerbate asthma. Um, from a workout standpoint, then what you'd have to do is you'd have to find where your, your mid-range level is, like right where you start to get to the point where you get out of breath, but not to the point where you're like, you know, like gonna pat, roll over and pass out. And so there's, there's gotta be a happy medium for you. Like and so, one of those, he always the heart yep. he, he goes like a mile away from mm -hmm. So he, should I, would it be beneficial for me to get one of those? Absolutely. We have, in, in Saginaw, we have a gym that we work with people, and there are certain people that wear those when they work out, and we can actually monitor where they are with their heart rate. And so we know exactly, you know, you need, either need to speed it up a little bit, you need to slow it down a little bit, just to keep them in that, that proper zone, and that would be very beneficial for you to know where that zone is. Very and so everybody's going to be different. I mean, it's, you have to know where like you're comfortable working out and how you respond afterwards. So the zone where you pass out afterwards, that's obviously not a good zone for you. And so you just have to, I feel like that every day I work out too. So. Yeah, I mean, that's a general, that's a general rule of thumb, but if you have asthma, it's obviously going to be modified. And so, I mean, if you get up around like 120 or something like that, and that's your best range for now, then that's the one you stick at. And you, you hit that range, and then you, you know, instead of doing the 20 second intervals, you essentially go till you hit that range. That's where your break starts. You go to, you hit that range, that's where your break starts. And so maybe that takes you 15 seconds, maybe it takes you a different amount of time. And so that's where everything, this is definitely not a one size fits all. Everybody in here is, you know, we have people, like I said, that uh, are 70 to 100 pounds overweight, they have diabetes, they have knee issues, everything has to be modified for that person. And so you doing your own research to set up the best program for you is very important. You know, we can help guide you in that direction but we don't know how you feel when you're exercising. That's definitely very important. Once you get over that bridge and you can start getting an exercise routine, then I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, you can improve, 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 and you're as tolerant to your exercise routine, and then you can keep seeing results with it. Sound good? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead. Exercise is the first thing that we talked about. Second thing we're gonna be talking about is going to be nutrition. So a lot of times nutrition is, is good. It's very important to get people in shape, but what happens is people incorporate an exercise routine without figuring out the proper nutritional protocol. So you go to the gym, you do an awesome, uh, awesome workout, you know, 30 minutes of hard intensity workout, and it just really kicks your butt. You're burning a ton of calories, you're burning a ton of energy. What happens when you go home and half an hour later, you're at home, what's gonna happen there? you're gonna get hungry because it's called working up an appetite, right? And so you go and you work out and you're creating a huge appetite. And so when you go home, you're gonna be really hungry. And so when you get home, what you're gonna be doing is going and eating whatever you would normally be eating. So if you don't know how to eat properly before you go home, it's gonna create you to a, a big cycle in the wrong direction. So what it'll do is it'll take you one step in the right direction by exercising. And then you're gonna take two steps in the wrong direction because you're eating unhealthy.
food. So you're doing the right stuff from the exercise standpoint, but what you need to do is compound those things together, have the right type of exercise, and also have the right nutrition to follow it up. And so that's going to be the, the next thing that we're talking about. And nutrition has uh, a lot of misconceptions in it. The basic nutrition class, we break down a lot of these different things from the proteins to the fats to the different types of carbohydrates and sugar. And so the body requires different nutrients at certain times, but we're not necessarily going to focus on that. We're going to be talking about the eating more standpoint and not worrying so much about um, counting different calories and whatnot. And so the medical world in most cases says if you burn more calories, then you take in, it's going to equal weight loss, right? This is essentially what we're told, out, told on a regular basis. If you burn more calories, then you take in, it's going to equal weight loss. But every single person in this room has a completely different metabolism, right? Every per single person in this room has a di completely different metabolism. How many people in here have sat in a research lab, analyzed to see how many calories they burn throughout a workout or throughout a given time of the day? Anybody? Nobody. And everybody's completely different, okay? So how would it, if, if, if you went to the grocery store and you picked up something that said 100 calories and you ate that 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 and everybody here ate that, is that going to be 100 calories specifically to everybody? Because everybody's metabolism is completely different. And so depending on how you digest that, that's completely different. So I'm not a fan of this at all because 50 years ago, do people count calories? No, they didn't. And we're in an epidemic of weight issues now, but before there was an epidemic of weight issues and, and all these different issues, nobody counted calories. Nobody read food labels because when you pick up a package of uh, fresh beef from the farm, there's no food label on it. Or you pick up a head of lettuce from the garden, there's no food label or tomato. You get my point, right? There's no food labels on real natural products, okay? And so in a lab environment, 100 calories is monitored in a lab. And it's when it heats it up one degree, depending on the food source, and that's how they get the calorie. But in the natural environment, when you're interacting with the world, that is not completely true. And the other thing that becomes a big problem is that these, these, there's certain nutritional programs that they have these point systems. And you get so many points of food that you can eat. And if you eat this food, it's four points. Or you eat this food, it's five points. And I've walked by people that were eating like, they're eating like five Pringles. They're like, well, I can have five Pringles because it's only one point. You know, I could eat a salad, which is also, you know, one point or whatever, or no points. But five Pringles are only one point, so it's equivalent to this. And so they're saying that this processed food is equal to eating these natural foods, which is completely untrue because what's the difference between processed food? <clears throat> For your body to process this food, that's 100 calories. Let's say... Um, Let's use an example. So a package of Twinkies, two Twinkies. Do they still make Twinkies? I know they were gone for a while. Okay, so Twinkies are back. Everybody's happy. So before they took them away and brought them back, I know that one package of Twinkie was 300 calories. Okay, 300 calories. Now, does anybody ever go to Meyer and buy Earthbound Organic uh, uh, mixed greens? So the, the big bin of mixed greens, not the little one, the big one. So that big bin of mixed greens, which is like, it's like this big, it's like this tall and this big. I mean, it's, it's a lot of salad in there. It's a lot of salad greens. How many calories do you think are in one of those? It's about, a, it's about 100, okay? So three bins, three of those huge bins, you stack them up, it'd be this high. It'd make you about 20 salads, right? Three of those huge bins is 300 calories. One package of two Twinkies is 300 calories, okay? So you can picture those. Now, I could sit down and easily eat two Twinkies. I could eat four or six or however many until I throw up, right? And so it's not going to fill you up at all. It's made from processed you know, sugars, chemicals, all this sort of modified stuff. They put in some artificial flavors and all that coloring. And so when you eat that, your body is using its own natural nutrients to process that through, okay? So it says 100 calories. And if you just look at it on paper, you go, well, this one's 100 calories. And this, these three things of greens are also 100 calories, so they must be equivalent for our body. From a calorie standpoint, those are equivalent calories. But if you take a step back and you go, there's no possible way that these two foods are equivalent. The greens come with all sorts of nutrients and enzymes and fiber and stuff that helps your body heal. It helps your brain function. It helps your organs heal. It helps with your digestion, right? 
you don't find that in the Twinkies. There's no way that you find that in the Twinkies. And so a calorie is not a calorie. A calorie of one gram of protein from grass-fed beef is not the same of one gram of protein from grain-fed beef. One calorie from grass-fed beef is not the same as one calorie from grain-fed beef. One calorie of you know wild-caught fish is not the same as grain-fed fish. You with me on this? So a calorie can never equal a calorie because it's not the same. The quality is completely different. And so calories out compared to calories in, nobody wants to count calories. It's no fun unless you're an Olympic lifter, bodybuilder, physique, and you want to really get into that sort of stuff. There, there's a place for that. Is anyone in here um, a physique competitor at a national level? Olympic lifter? No. Marathon runner? Yeah. <laughs> that's my point the average person I'm none of those things right and so my point is you don't want to do that so let's go through a few things I have calories on here to show you so Snickers they say satisfied on the side right so Snickers satisfied so you eat one I'm never satisfied if I just eat one so I have to eat more right and so you could sit down and you if, if I was hungry I could sit down and eat five Snickers real easily and then this number is going to add up real quickly. We're not counting calories, but then you're getting over a thousand unhealthy calories. You got my point here? That's not going to fill me up. What would fill me up would be five eggs. Protein is the number one most satisfying thing that you can eat. Fat is the number two most satisfying thing you can eat. So foods that have healthy protein and healthy fat are very satisfying. And so you sit down, and actually, if you sit down and you eat like two or three eggs over easy, that'll usually fill most people up, right? But you sit down, you eat two or three of these, it's just going to make you hungry, especially the sugar content is going to spike your blood sugar, and then it's going to come down, and you're going to say, I need more Snickers, and pretty soon, you're eating Snickers all day long. So the point is of the eat more is eat more real food. If there's not a nutrition label on there, odds are it's more natural. It's going to fill you up better. And so eat more real food. So these sugars in a Coke spike your blood sugar substantially. I mean, this is one of the big issues with the uh, obesity epidemic. Not, not, not just Coke, but it's drinks in general out of convenience. Even when people are going to get their uh, latte from the, the coffee shop, when they're getting the you know, their orange juice or their, their fruit juice that they're drinking on a regular basis that they think are healthy, if you actually look at the amount of sugar that's in these things, there's a substantial amount of sugar that's in these things. So this is a huge issue. So 210 calories in this Coke here. But if you take a thing of nuts, what do you find in nuts? Nuts have a lot of calories in a small handful. But what do they also have? They have fats, they have protein, and they have fiber. And so they're more likely to be a lot, satis a lot more satisfying than drinking this. So why a lot of times do they always bring the, the drinks right away when you come out to get your meal, even before you order? What do you guys want to drink as soon as you sit down? So you get that Coke, right, and you start drinking it, and when you sat down to have your, your meal, you were you know, kind of hungry, but as soon as you start eating that or drinking that Coke, now you're like, oh, I'm real hungry. I'm not just going to get this. I'm going to get this and this and this. And so this actually stimulates your appetite. As soon as you give it that little burst of sugar, it just makes you... So 210 calories, 210 calories. What's going to help fill you up a lot better and maintain your, your blood sugar? 100% that. So what about this? 590 calories, six-piece chicken McNugget, and another Coke, right? You know, and the people, if you do exercise on a regular basis and you're hungry, I'm sure you could sit down. I know a lot of the high schoolers, they would go and they would see how many chicken McNuggets they could eat, and they'd be like 30... Chicken McNuggets, you can sit down and eat those. So you do the math and see how many calories are in those, a lot. Or you could go with a salad. So greens, they take up a ton of space in your stomach. You know, even though they are not a protein and they're not a fat, they still are a big bulky food and they take up a lot of space in your stomach. And so it's going to help to fill you up a lot quicker. And then you throw protein on there. You throw chicken on top of that, along with maybe some vegetables on top. You throw in a bowl, a bowl of fruit, water. Water can be filling as well, you know, it keeps you satisfied. A lot of times when people are hungry, they're actually just thirsty. And so if they would just drink a little bit more water, it would, it would help their appetite. You have some fat here, and my wife threw in some dark chocolate as well, right? And so all coming in 
less calories. We're not counting calories, but it is less calories. But these calories are way more nutritious, and this is going to fill you up a lot more. It's like if you sit down and you, if you're hungry, and you could open up a bag of chips, and you could just sit there and you could just eat those chips and eat those chips and eat those chips. And when you get down to those chips, you could eat, find something else to eat, 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 right? People do this. But if you sit down and you eat one chicken breast, and you're just like, oh, I'm still hungry. Okay, eat another chicken breast. And if you eat more than two chicken breasts, you know, that's going to fill you up very quickly. People usually won't eat more than one or two chicken breasts, but they'll sit down and they'll munch on these snacks all day long. So if you go towards the protein, towards the fat, eat more of those, less of the processed carbohydrates. It's going to fill you up. So this is the general breakfast for, you know, most kids, a lot of adults as well. So orange juice, what's the problem with orange juice? Sugar. So oranges can be healthy, right? They're natural. You can get them from nature. Oranges can be healthy. But you take the orange and you squeeze it, you take the juice away from the orange, you're taking the juice away from the fiber and the enzymes and the nutrients and all the nu nutrition that's inside that actual orange in its natural state. And now you get this juice, which is pure sugar, and they add in more sugar to cancel out the acidity on there, and they add in food dye, and they add in uh, the artificial uh, perfume to make it smell and taste the specific way it is. So the sugar, and you grab them in a, a bowl of cereal, which is also sugar. So you wake up, you eat sugar and sugar, 326 calories of sugar to start off your day. How's that gonna, it's gonna get your blood sugar here, and it's go down. And then about an hour and a half later, you go into the vending machine to get more snacks, the Snickers that we talked about on the first slide. And then for lunch, you're going to McDonald's to talk about the, get the chicken nuggets that we talked about on the second slide. So here we have omelet. We have a real orange instead of the orange juice. We have some tea and a bowl of blueberries. Same calories, way more nutrients that are going to satisfy you. Nutrients are also very satisfying. So don't even think about the, the protein and the fat, which are very satisfying, but think about nutrients. Now, why do a lot of people have cravings on a regular basis? So you think about, think about someone who's 100 pounds overweight and they, they're, you, know, you look at them, you're like, man, that person must eat everything. They're always eating, they're always eating. But if they're always eating food that's processed and it doesn't have magnesium or iron or zinc or calcium or any of these, these vital nutrients to our body, what does the body do? It's looking for those nutrients out of the food, so it creates cravings. So it says, you're still hungry because you need to find something that's actually going to fulfill these stores of magnesium and, and iron and zinc and calcium and all these different things. And so it tells them they're hungry again. And so they go out and they eat more of the processed food here that's enriched with these nutrients, but it's not the same. So they eat that food, and their body goes, okay, that was great, but I need some more of the real food. So they go and eat more of this and more of this, and this is where the cycle happens. All this excess sugar gets stored as fat in the body, and that's where the whole cycle starts, and unfortunately, most people never break that cycle. But the beautiful thing about omelets is that you can take a, a shell with eggs, and you can throw whatever you want in that, right? Wrap it up, and you can eat it. So you don't have to eat omelets just for breakfast. They're great for lunch and dinner and any time throughout the day as well. So omelets, way more nutritious. When you go to different open houses and parties and this sort of stuff, there's always platefuls of, there's tons and tons of snacks out, right? And so cheese and crackers, it's a delicious snack, right? But it adds up real quickly. And so the processed cheese from grain-fed cows cause a lot of digestive issues, cause a lot of other inflammatory issues. The crackers, processed carbohydrate, grains, digestive issues, inflammatory issues for most people. And so you get 230 calories of digestive issues and inflammation. And just for jokes here, we have four cucumbers, three red peppers, a head of celery, and uh, a bowl of uh, hummus as well, okay? And so if you're at a party and you, you, they have those vegetable trays and you're eating a whole bunch more of that, you're getting nutrients from this. You're getting nutrients from all this sort of stuff. You're not getting any nutrients from here. But it's also gonna help to satisfy you. If you sat down and you ate four, cumbers, four cucumbers, three peppers, and a whole head of celery, you're probably not gonna be that hungry after that, are you? And so that's probably going to fill you up pretty good from that standpoint. Uh, question, yep. What if it's not organic, fresh, fat? How does that fill Yep, so the, the non-organic definitely plays a factor in there. You know, if, if you have the ability to go towards organic fruits and vegetables, um, I would definitely do that. What you'd want to do is you can get online, you can find the, the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And so the Dirty Dozen are the, 
the 12 most contaminated fruits and vegetables. And those are the ones that you want to consider buying organic. After that, you can pretty much buy them however you want. Um, but from an organic standpoint, it, it can have a, a impact on the nutrient content. So when you have that option, if you're going to the local farmer's market here in Midland and you're finding farmers that are raising their things more naturally, obviously that's going to be a, a better option for, for you and for the environment as well. And so definitely a very important thing too. So kind of let's review what we talked about. Everything we wanted to keep in here is basic concepts and we're pulling information from all the different diets out there. And so when you're looking at the, the different exercise and nutritional protocols, this is pretty much something that almost all people can agree on. When you get outside of that and you start talking about, you know, the how much meat should you be eating and how much of this should you be eating, that's where it gets a little bit more complex. But what we talked about tonight is pretty much what a lot of people can agree on. The interval training, if you're in a facility that um, people are, are doing interval training, um, I own a gym back in, in Saginaw and every person, I was noticing this, every person that's been coming in, we opened up about a year ago, every person that has been coming into the gym for that whole year doing the high, the interval training, the high intensity, and it's everybody from teenagers to people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. We had a cool testimonial from a guy had uh, diabetes that was skyrocketed. You know, he was a person that was on a heart monitor. He couldn't even get his heart rate up to a certain level. Um, that we've been working with, but every single person that's been coming into that gym since the time that we opened has lost weight, has gained more muscle, has gotten toned. And so it's th there's, no, there's no surprise to this. If you do this type of stuff from an exercise standpoint on a regular basis, you will see results. You will see results. If you have some other big outlying issue with uh, thyroid or something like that, that's where I say you have to prepare your body and you have to get that sort of stuff ironed out before you jump into a routine like this. But the people who do this, it's so cool because I was there uh, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and I saw a lot of the people coming through. And um, I don't get to work out during the week, so I don't get to see these people on a regular basis necessarily. And so when I do see them, and some of the people I haven't seen for a few months, and I see them, I'm like, don't even recognize these people. And what they're doing, they're going to the gym three to four days a week. The, the classes that are, they are an hour long, but there's always like a skill for 15, 20 minutes, stretching and skill at the beginning, 15, 20 minutes. Most of the workouts, the high intensity part, 15 to 25 minutes for the high intensity. And then there's a, maybe a cool down or doing some abdominal work or something like that. And so the bulk of the exercise is happening in, in 15 to 25 minutes, along with the, the warm up and the cool down. But if you're at home or you're in a hurry, you skip, you know, do a little bit of a warm up, do your exercise, and then you're good. You can do, you can literally do that in 15 to 20 minutes. It's something that's way more sustainable than, you know, having two and a half hours every single day or, you know, go in the gym or an hour and a half or whatever. Um, we're definitely a huge fan of coming to the gym and having access to all this equipment because it just makes it so much easier. Plus you're surrounded by people who are on the same page as you. They're exercising and it makes it a lot easier because sometimes at home it keeps it harder to be on track. And then the, the eat more is don't count calories. Don't worry about how much food you're eating. If you're eating real food, Eat as much as you want until you're satisfied. The Okinawans actually, they have a rule, eat until you eat natural food until you're 80% satisfied and then wait like, I think it's wait 10 or 15 minutes and then your body's gonna register that you are satisfied. And so they eat till they're 80% satisfied, they push the plate away and then they're satisfied. Except here we eat processed food till we're 120% satisfied and then we have dessert. And so that's where the problem arises. So exercise less by doing the interval training eat more healthy natural foods. If it doesn't have a food label, then you're on the right track eating the right, right types, types of food on a regular basis. So. Of course. Yeah. And that's why they tell you is to eat, put your pork down chew yeah. a little bit. Back up. And a lot of the cultures that um, if you read like the blue zones and you study some of the centenarians, these people that live to be 100 plus years old, the dinner is, is like an experience. It's like, you know, it's a family thing. Their family and their friends are there. It takes time. They enjoy their dinner, their meal, and they, they eat slowly and they have conversations and that sort of stuff. They're not sitting down eating real quick so they could sit down and watch American Idol or whatever's on TV. You know, that's that's part of the fast pace, you know, if you can just slow down the, the whole routine. 
and then your body's going to register that you're full quicker and it's obviously going to benefit you from that standpoint. So that's a good, very good point. Any other? Uh, the body, the runner's body gets so used to knowing that there's going to be a huge uh, calorie expenditure that it actually holds on yeah. to the, the fat more or yeah. because it's, it's predictable. The burden. It's, it's predictable. It's always, the body is always, always, always trying to save energy and you have to, you have to surprise it to burn that energy off. Exactly. Yeah. And if you if you're doing interval training let's say you are doing interval training you're doing the same exercises day after day after day then your body will still adapt to that to a certain extent so I mean even if you're doing every few days you're switching out up what you're doing that's it's exactly right yeah Oh, no question. Exactly. I mean, you, I mean, you hit it right on the head. I was in Florida. I remember going to the Gold's Gym. The day I got there, there was a lady who was on the, the treadmill in the front. And day after day after day, same, same. <laughs> she never lost weight. And she was always in there every single day. After four years of me being in there, still in there. And she was never losing weight. And it's just like you just want to walk up to her and be like, do something different. It's not working, you know. Switch up what you're doing. So that's definitely good. We still live? No, I was just say anybody who's watching. Thanks for watching tonight. And if you have questions, just go ahead and uh, email us on Karis Health or um, give the office a call for any specific questions that you might have. Yes. What's your like? There's that video. Of the juice. What's your opinion on juicing? Like I like to sometimes. Make a juice for like breakfast or lunch. Yeah, absolutely. So you're supposed to use more vegetables to give you use a lot of fruit and it's like the pizza from McDonald's. Sure, and it totally depends on on your activity level and everything. I actually posted just on Facebook, just posted a picture about juicing because I I love for whatever reason like this time of year I just crave making juices. Like I love making juices. As soon as summer ends and fall comes around, I love making shakes. I love blending. It's just like the difference. But I'm I'm definitely not against juicing. Uh, I love juicing and blending. Um, you can get in trouble by doing way too much sugars in a juice because it makes it taste. I mean, if you put in a couple apples and you're putting in tons of carrots and that sort of stuff, you can get in trouble. But the other thing is if you're a big exerciser and you're going to go to the gym, you're going to be burning a lot of energy, that's not a necessarily a bad thing anyways because it totally depends on what your goals are. If you're going to the gym and you want to maintain your muscle, you want to build muscle, you want to gain some weight and, and get more tone, which a lot of guys do, some women do want to do that as well. Having that little boost of energy before they work out can be very beneficial. If you're trying to lose weight, then yeah, you're going to want to do more celery and cucumbers and ginger and kale and all that sort of stuff. That's going to add the liquid, but it's going to also add nutrients without the sugar. So, Karen, I have a lot of recipe. It's ginger, apple, and carrots. And I like to drink it for breakfast. Yeah. So, I like kind of hurting myself because I'm. I'm having the sugar of the apple and the, I would, the carrot. I would, um, I mean, just add in more celery or cucumbers into it. Just make more liquid from that sort of stuff. And then do more of kale or something like that in there. You can get it online and find a million different recipes yeah, for that. Yeah, I think this is the Joe that does the three-day juice, the five-day juice, 30-day. He does a, uh, his, his is 30. Joe Cross, he does a 30-day and like, that's, right. I don't know about his five-day. He, he might do some stuff with that, but. Um, there's a lot of different juicing type programs out there, but a lot of people do very well with that. I have a few clients that are doing juicing protocols right now, and they're doing really well with it. And it's cool. I mean, their skin changes. You start to see their face thin out, and overall, they, they lose weight doing it. And they're doing, you know, what whatever the recipe is on some of these. It's uh, six kale leaves, one cucumber, four celery stalks, two green apples, half a lemon, and a piece of ginger. So they don't have carrots in there. The, the sugar is all coming from the gra two green apples. And even if you make this with two green apples, it's very sweet. Like you can easily do one apple, and it's just not nearly as sweet. Yeah, grapes. If you use the grapes, that's like. Mm -hmm. I like to drink my grapes with wine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you were talking about the exercise protocol, you had mentioned uh, stretching and skill. 
Yeah, and so when I, when I say skill in our gym, it's uh, practicing. If, if let's say you're doing a squat and you're not comfortable squatting down that far, it'd be doing things to get better at squatting down farther okay. or doing things to improve. If you like to run, doing things to practice your form. And so it's, it's very important because most people, they just go to a gym and they just start lifting and doing things, but you can get hurt doing that. And so we're very big on teaching people how to lift properly and do exercises properly. Even things like doing down ups and burpees and, and push ups. A lot of people, if they're doing push ups, their elbows come out. You need to get the elbows in. You know, there's all sorts of little things. And so that's what is very important from an exercise routine. Yes. Yeah. Big time. You got it. You're teaching the next class. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for coming. We'll uh, keep you guys in the loop for when the classes are going to be coming up. I know the summer's a little bit slower, but so I always thank and congratulate everybody for coming out tonight because it is nice outside and at least you have a few more hours to go outside and get moving. So if you have any questions, just give us, uh, give us a call. If you're on Facebook, join the Facebook page and we post some stuff there. It's been a little slow. I'll start getting some more stuff on there as well. So, yep.